You know, Nia led us in that last song, Worthy is Your Name. And in her prayer, she reminded us that what worship really is. I, I think if you're new, uh, welcome. But if you're new to not just this church, but church in general, sometimes it can feel like, well, there's a lot of singing and then this guy talks. What's going on? When we come together and we lift our voices in praise, we're, we're declaring with our voices and our minds and our hearts who God is. That he alone is worthy. In fact, the word worship means worth-ship. He's worth our devotion and our praise. He is worth our uh, whole lives. And you can worship him in your car by yourself. Your whole life is meant to be worship. But c- specifically, particularly, when God's people come together and praise him through song, his spirit reminds our minds and our hearts of who he is. And that's a good thing. And Christians have been doing this since the very beginning. Worthy is his name. Worthy is he above all others. All of our life is meant to be a a devotion, an expression of worship. In particular, our giving of ourselves and our resources. And so to those of you who are regularly generous to Chapel Street Church, thank you. We're approaching the the end of our fiscal year. You may not know this, but our ministry year and our fiscal year ends in August and begins in September, and we're approaching the end. And we just want to say to those of you who consistently contribute to the mission of God here, that's an act of worship, and we're grateful. And God is using it to make a difference. Let's bow once more and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord God, you alone are worthy of our praise and our full devotion. And if we're honest, there are times that we forget that. There are other voices competing for our devotion in our world. And it's a good thing to gather together with your people and praise your name. And as we do, your spirit reminds us that you alone are worthy. So Lord, speak to us now through your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. A quick question. How many of you here are dog people? Show of hands. My people. Yes. I won't ask who are cat people because we have a support group for you. That's different. (laughs) I'm sorry. Kind of. Not really. Anyway. See, I'm here of my my dog, Ivy. That's my wife and and our dog, Ivy. Yes. Oh. By the way, I put my wife on the screen because tomorrow is our 30th anniversary. Can you believe that? Yeah. I know. 30 years. We married very young. Anyway, that's our dog, Ivy. Ivy is, uh, well, anyway, take that on faith. Uh, our dog Ivy is 15 years old and she's like living with a crazy person in the house. She's medicated and anxious and weird and has issues, but she will not die. <laughs> not, not that I want her to, she just goes on and on. Uh, and uh, <laughs> she's got this indomitable spirit in her. Many times we thought it was the end and then she would recover. And so anyway, she's never really been a, she never really begged for food. Like some dogs, they beg constantly. She's never really done that. She doesn't really have a desire for people food. Uh, except when we're not around. Like if we leave her alone for too long, she loses all control. And like many of you could probably tell similar stories. She's eaten whole bags of Hawaiian rolls that were way up on the counter. I don't know how she got to them. She's eaten bags of my wife's coffee candies. She's eaten an entire bag of Kuiper's apple cider donuts, which I, I wanted to put her down after that. <laughs> Today we're talking about wisdom and self-control. The wisdom of God's word applied to our lives and the issue of self-control. And I think in some ways people are like dogs in that we have less self-control when we're by ourselves. Somehow Ivy doesn't do this sort of thing when I'm around. But in isolation she does naughty things. She loses control. Maybe you can relate to that. The times when I have been least self-controlled in my life have been the times when I have been left to my own devices, outside the influence of others. Let me just read a few key proverbs we're going to look through um, today. The first one is a passage we'll, we'll return to over and over again, but a few passages on this issue from, from the wisdom of Proverbs. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his imagination. 
This week in our preaching team meeting, we meet every Thursday morning, all of us who preach, whether however frequently, and talk through and pray through the text for the week ahead and the two weeks ahead. Pastor Brian said something that stuck with me. He said, you know, self-control is like the secret sauce of living wisely. See, self-control is like the secret sauce of applying wisdom. It's, it's a prerequisite to wisdom. I mean, what good is it to know the right thing to do if you lack the ability to do it? What good is it to know the wrong thing to do if you lack the ability to not do it? I think he's right. Self-control, whatever that is, and we're going to talk about it, is sort of the secret sauce to applying divine wisdom to your life. Because wisdom is not just knowledge. It's divine knowledge rightly applied to life circumstances. The art of living well in light of God's wisdom. And it requires self-control. Without it, we're kind of left vulnerable, defenseless, in trouble. I would suggest to you the greatest struggle of your life is the struggle within. The greatest issue is internal. Nobody has led me astray in my life more than me. Can you relate to that? Nobody's lied to me more than me. Nobody's tempted me more than me. We want to pretend it's someone else. It's out there. It's the government. It's the Democrats. It's the Republicans. It's those people. It's this issue. The truth is, it's in here. That's the biggest struggle of my life. And so we need to apply God's wisdom right there. This brings us to the need for self-control. The need. It's not just a biblical idea, by the way. It's a, it's, it's a virtue of the Greek philosophers, particularly a, a school of philosophy known as the Stoic, Stoics, Stoicism. Have you heard of the Stoics or Stoicism? Perhaps the most famous, Marcus Aurelius, but Seneca, Epictetus. And if you don't know those names, you might know some of the, the more modern names. Guys like uh, Jordan Peterson, Jocko Willink. These writers that are drawing on Stoic philosophy as a rule for life. Epictetus wrote this, No man is free who is not a master of himself. The Stoic idea of self-control is you must master yourself. And by the way, that's the idea in Proverbs that if you cannot rule over your own spirit, you're in trouble. So you're not free until you master yourself. Here's what Marcus Aurelius wrote in many places. He wrote, you must assemble your life yourself, action by action. Decision by decision, action by action, you construct your own life. Now, in our day, there's been, as I said, a resurgence of this idea. It's a whole host of what they call the Neo-Stoicism or New Stoics authors that are drawing on this ancient wisdom and writing bestsellers and podcasts and so on. And there's a lot of appeal in Stoic philosophy. It appeals to me. The idea of personal ownership and accountability, taking control of your life, learning to do hard things, suffering for your own sake and for the sake of others. Delayed gratification, denying yourself certain pleasures for a greater good down the road. All these things are, there's a lot of good in this. There's a lot of wisdom in this. These are all things that are lacking to a large degree in our culture today. And by the way, it's, if you're tracking on this sort of thing, you'll notice that the authors I'm mentioning have become uh, bestsellers, particularly among young men looking for purpose and meaning in their lives. But for all of its appeal, there's something lacking in Stoic philosophy. Something that the Christian gospel has, which we'll come back to in a few moments. Look at verse 28 again of Proverbs 25. A man without self-control, or a woman for that matter, is like a city broken into and left without walls. A couple things here. First of all, we'll see that, um, that the man in this passage is compared to a city, the person, and without... And without self-control and walls. So you see the comparison here. And the, so you have a man compared to a city. And the condition of that man uh, is without self-control is like a city without walls. And what the result is broken into. Vulnerable. In a dangerous position. Self-control is the Hebrew word matzar. Literally means restrain, rule over, hold back. The person who cannot 
rule over, restrain, hold in place, in proper place, their own spirit, their own desires, their own mind, their own emotions, their own will, is vulnerable to the chaos that will inevitably come in. Cities today don't have walls. Geneva is not a walled city, right? We don't leave the walls of Geneva and go to the walls of Batavia and knock on the city gate. That's not how it works today. If you visit a city in the, of, in, in the world that has walls, it's a historical curiosity. It's kind of cool and interesting, but they don't serve the same purpose. In the ancient world, all the great cities had walls. My wife and I had the privilege and pleasure of traveling to Greece and Turkey earlier this summer. We visited lots of ancient cities and lots of ancient walls we saw. One, of course, is the city of today, Istanbul, then Constantinople. You'll see an image here on the screen. This is taken from the Bosphorus uh, Canal Channel, or, uh, you know, uh, between the Aegean Sea and the Black Sea. And these are part of the, what, this is Ottoman walls, but the walls of what would have been ancient Constantinople that haven't been destroyed. Here's another image of the, the, the fifth century walls of Constantinople as they exist today. Broken down, overgrown, not holding much in or out today. We visited the ancient city of Sardis, by the way, on our trip. Here's an image of Sardis you'll see on the screen here. So this is the, I'm standing next to the steps to the great temple of Artemis in this ancient city of Sardis. And uh, this is on the valley below. Way up here on the top, you see this part right here? That's the Acropolis Hill. That's, the, what's, that's all that and that little bit right there are all that's remaining of the once great walls of the city of Sardis. Sardis was the capital city of the kingdom of Lydia. Uh, the myth and tradition tells us that King Midas came from this region. In the 6th century, Crescens was king there. Uh, it was a fabulously wealthy city. And this, the citadel, the stronghold of the city, was up on that Acropolis. And they thought it was the, the cliffs were so sheer and the walls so thick and so high, it was impregnable. However, two times in the 6th and 7th century, it was conquered in the same way. Let me tell you the story. In the 6th century B.C., uh, Cyrus the Great of Persia comes to attack the kingdom of Lydia. This city. Cannot find a way up. And most of the Persian army was cavalry, not ready for a siege. And so after two and a half weeks, Cyrus was about to give up. But he issued a decree to his soldiers. He, he said, if any of you can find a way into the city, a way to scale the walls, a way in, a breach in the walls, some way in, you know, I'll give you, like he promised them, fabulous wealth and a position in his, you know, in his palace. Nobody could do it. Many of his soldiers tried to scale the walls and were killed. Nobody could make it the way up. One soldier remembered seeing a Lydian soldier weeks before who was leaning against the wall and unintentionally as he moved his arm knocked over a bronze helmet shining in the sun which fell off the wall. And he watched him from a distance as he climbed down a secret route in the wall to retrieve his helmet and climb back up. And he remembered that and he said, I think I can do it. And he climbed up by night, let his fellows in. The Persian army captured Sardis. 200 years later, almost the exact same thing happened with Antiochus the Great came to attack the city. The same thing. And they didn't put soldiers on the wall because they thought nobody could scale it. Nobody can get in. The point is, other than being a cool historical story, which I like to tell, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much of a breach or a break or a vulnerability in the walls for the enemy to get in. It doesn't take much in our lives for that which we want to keep out to get in. This brings us to the nature of self-control. The nature of self-control. Let's, let's come back for a moment and ask the question, how do you become the kind of person who makes wise decisions, who lives widely, wisely, how do we get this wisdom and this self-control? Go back once more to Proverbs 25, 28 and look at our key verse here. We're told that a man without self-control is a city and left without walls. Specifically, what are the walls that God wants us to have in our lives? Let me start by saying what they're not. Sometimes in Christianity, 
Walls, uh, we, we think about walls as like the, the church is the gated or walled community. We're trying to keep all the bad people out, all the evil people out, all the sinful, immoral, and corrupt people out, and all the good people in. That's not what Proverbs is saying here. That's not the vision God has for his people. So our walls are not against other people. They're not walls of division and fear and hostility. They're not really even walls against like other groups. They're internal walls around our heart. Proverbs chapter four says, above all else, guard your what? Heart. For from it flows life. The walls are meant to keep us protected so that we can live in line with God's wisdom. It's not against those people, but of our own heart. Because there is an enemy who would corrupt and deceive and mislead and destroy your heart if he could. So, how is the condition of your walls? What are, where are you most vulnerable in your life? If you were trying to attack you, that might be a strange question to ask. If you were going to come after you and take you down, how would you do it? Where are your vulnerabilities? Remember the Old Testament story of Nehemiah? If you don't know the story of Nehemiah, there's a book written about him called Nehemiah. He is a, he's a leader of Israel and he's in exile, returning to Jerusalem after many years in exile, bringing God's people back. And he has permission to go back and rebuild the city. And the first thing that he does when he arrives is to take a nighttime ride around the city inspecting its walls. What's the condition of the walls? Where, is it, where are we most vulnerable? Where do we most need to focus our attention in repairing? And that's the story of the first few chapters of Nehemiah, rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the security and protection of the city. It's a historical story, but also a metaphor for our own lives. Maybe, maybe a way to start for you in applying self-control to your life is to ask God, God, would you, would you help me take me around the walls of my own heart and point out to me the vulnerabilities, the places where it's broken down and left unattended? That might be a good place to start. Because going back to the Stoic, self-control is not just about self-determination and self-discipline and doing it yourself. Look at Galatians chapter 5. You'll know this passage. Anton read it to us a moment ago during worship. I didn't even know he was going to do that. That's how the Lord works. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now, before this, he lists all of the, of the, the, the desires of the flesh. All the stuff we're trying not to live according to, that we don't want to get into our hearts. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Now you could stop right there. The Spirit produces in us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. And, isn't that interesting? And self-control. Wait a minute, self and spirit. Are we to be controlled by the Spirit? Or are we to exercise self-control? It sounds almost contradictory. How can the Spirit produce self-control? This is the, the beauty of the Christian gospel, in part. It's, it's amazing that Paul lists self-control as one of the fruits. Actually, not the fruits. The fruit, the collective fruit of the Spirit. The key distinction between the Christian understanding of self-control and the Stoics is that we're not left to ourselves to control ourselves. There is a spirit residing within us, given to us by God, his spirit, the Holy Spirit, indwelling our hearts and minds and enabling us to exercise a control that would not otherwise be possible. Because Paul will say elsewhere in the New Testament, we have a new self to put off the old self and put on the new self. And so the spirit of God in our minds and hearts enables us to live according to the new self. That's Christian self-control. Not you just try harder to be a better version of you. There's no life in that. There's no real freedom in that. Paul says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. 
For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of what? Say it with me. Power and love and self-control. God has given you a spirit of power, strength beyond yourself, of love characterized by his love and grace, and self-control. This is crucial. If you're in Christ, if you're a Christian, it doesn't mean you're perfect, but it means you have the Holy Spirit residing in you, enabling you to live according to the new self that he's given you. So I'll put it this way, simply. We can practice self-control because we are controlled by the Spirit of God. This is the uniqueness and power of the gospel message. And frankly, I don't want to be under self-control. Do you? I know myself too well. It, would be, it goes wrong if myself apart from Christ is in charge. And you might disagree with this, but I'll just submit to you that yourself, apart from the influence of the Holy Spirit, is, is not qualified to be in control of your life. It's going to go wrong. You know the poem Invictus? Maybe you've seen the movie Invictus. You know that famous line in the poem Invictus? I am the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. Right? You know that line? Maybe you've heard that. No, you're not. No, you're not. We are all under the control and influence of someone and something else. From social media algorithms to political pundits to our own selfish desires, we are being influenced and controlled. The only question is, who? Who's qualified? It isn't you. It isn't me. It's the power of God. It's the Lord Jesus and his spirit. I would suggest this as we move to the last point. Ultimately, self-control is about who you love the most. It's about your deepest desires. This brings us to the name of self-control. So without self-control, we're vulnerable and we, and we need it to live in a wise and fulfilled life. And the nature of self-control is not self, but the spirit. But what do we mean by the name? What's the name of self-control? Look at Proverbs 18, verses 10 through 11. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city. And like a high wall in his imagination. The contrast here is between two places of refuge. The name of the Lord or your wealth. Or it could be anything, right? So the wise, righteous person runs to the name of God. The fool, in this case specifically, the rich man, runs to something else, his wealth. His reputation, something else. It's a good question to ask yourself. Where do you run? Where do you run for safety, for security, for a sense of your identity? Where do you go? Where do you turn? What's your strong tower in that sense? We're told that the, the wealthy man is a fool because it's imaginary. My wealth will protect me. My wealth is my identity. My wealth is my security. Well, what does it mean then to run to the name of the Lord? I think it means this. I think it means to remind yourself and to forcefully tell yourself, preach to yourself even, who God is, what his character and nature is like, that he can be trusted even when in the moment you feel like going a different direction. You ever have wake-up calls in your life? Like, whoa, I didn't see that. Years ago, many years ago, I was driving back from uh, St. Charles on uh, uh, 31, coming uh, into Geneva. It was raining really hard. And I was by myself in my car, and I was uh, four or five lights ahead of me. They were stopped at a traffic light. I could see that happening. I was slowing down, and this guy was tailing me really fast on 31 in the pouring rain. And I was getting irritated. Like, what is this guy's problem? He pulls around me as we approach the stoplight, yanks in front of me, slams on his brakes. I almost hit him. It's pouring rain. I snapped. I got out of my car in the pouring rain, went to his driver's side window, pounded on his window, and said, what is your problem? And then in that moment, I realized, I think I have a problem. <laughs> he looked at me like, oh, yeah. and I went, oh, sorry, sorry. Got back in my car soaking wet and drove home like, what, what? 
What happened there? Not under the control of the Spirit. Can I tell you, that guy came to church three weeks later. And I saw him in the lobby. And he saw me. I'm like, go, 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 go. I talked to him and it's, it's good. You have these moments in your life and you don't realize there's another, there's another power in control of my life. I don't, I don't regularly have road rage. I, I, but the wisdom of Proverbs says, run to the name of the Lord. He's your refuge. He's your identity. He's your security. There's a place in Jonathan Edwards, uh, uh, he wrote a book called The Freedom of the Will. Brilliant, brilliant mind, uh, wrote a book called The Freedom of the Will. And he says this, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, because he wrote like a Puritan with lots of me thinks and thou's and stuff. But he says this, no one ever does anything they don't want to do. You might think, no, no wait a second. Like somebody puts a gun to your, in your chest and says, give me your wallet. I gave my wallet, I didn't want to. Actually, you did. You wanted to live, well, then you wanted your wallet. He says, at the deepest level, ultimately speaking, we always do what we most want to do in the moment. So the secret of self-control is to want Christ more than anything else. And to have that desire so present in our minds that it's tangible and it prevents us from going some other direction giving vent to our anger or our greed or our pride or our jealousy or our lust. Because I want him more than anything else. Here's how Paul puts it in his letter in the New Testament to Titus, chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This, I want you to see the, con, the, the, the connection here between present age and waiting for our blessed hope. Self-control is, is, the key to it is this. We're in the present age looking to the future and what's true and who's most real, our blessed hope, Jesus Christ. And that enables me by his spirit to live for him in this present moment. The grace of God has appeared. Ultimately speaking, self-determination, strength of will, fear, these don't lead to life or joy or freedom, but the grace of God in Christ and the spirit of God within us do. We're going to close the service by coming to communion, which I think is appropriate if you look at the grace of God has appeared. We celebrate that grace at his table. If you did not receive the cup, uh, please put your hand up and ushers will bring it to you. Maybe we have somebody in the back there. See there, right there. Good. On the bottom is the bread, on top is the cup, and I'm going to lead you through taking the elements in just a moment. But let's bow our heads in a moment of silence and ask God to speak to our hearts as we prepare to come to his table. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we, um, we try to control things ourselves and that is not the nature of true self-control. And in this moment, we want to lay ourselves down and surrender again to the grace of your spirit. And we're asking you, Lord, like Nehemiah, to walk us around the walls of our heart and point out the places where we're most vulnerable, where you want to do your work, where we most need your grace. And we trust and know that because of Jesus on the cross, your grace is is sufficient and we are forgiven and free. Amen. I just want to remind you if you're uh, visiting with us, it doesn't matter to us if you're a member here, a regular tender, or if it's your first time here. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, then you're welcome to observe communion at his table. Let's peel off that bottom layer and take the bread in our hands. And I remind you that Jesus called himself the bread of life and he said, this is my body. It is given for you. Eat this and remember him.
And after they had eaten, Jesus poured out a cup and he said to them, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink this and remember him. Amen. I love the line, be thou my wisdom, thou my true word. Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God. People of God, may you go in the wisdom and power of God. In the name of Jesus, may he be your strong tower and your hiding place now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.